I just want to introduce Bob as, as somebody I've known for a very, very long time, a very close friend of mine, and he's been an, um, a supporter of, of real agile. I've, I've seen him in, in, in action. I've been a friend, a peer, and it's amazing the, the, um, the passion that he shows when he's on it. Sometimes it's hard to explain because he's, he's also very aggressive at, at certain times because it's, you know, uh, the passion coming out of him. But I, I'm just honored to, to, to be his friend. And, and I really, really, really cherish all the, all the great moments we've had transforming organizations. So, Bob, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Let me start sharing my screen. And I apologize for any... Uh, Oh, let me see. Yeah, so I think it's this, and we'll get started with now. We'll get started with behavior-driven development, and this is my experience. Okay, so with behavior-driven development, there are certain expected benefits. Behavior-driven development offers a more precise guidance on organizing the conversation between developers, testers, and domain experts also known as the triad or the three amiga. So um, it really, it is, it really does drive good conversation. Negotiation, I'm sorry, notations originating in the behavior driven development approach. In particular, the given when then canvas are closer to everyday language and have a shallower learning curve compared to those of other tools. Tools targeting a BDD approach generally afford the automatic generation of technical and end user documentation from behavior-driven development specifications. And feel free to interrupt at any time if you have questions. Uh, I am not uh, monitoring the chat, so you'll have to speak up or have someone else speak up for you. Give me a second, let me put it on speaker. Okay. So, um, this was my reality at the time that I first implemented behavior-driven development. And my reality was developers are compensated with money more than testers. Testers more than the general corporate users. So what we wanted was, and the developers are in higher demand than testers and testers more than general corporate users. Bear with me for a second. Hey, Bob. Yes. Before you get too deep, can you define behavior-driven development for those that may not know? Yes, we'll get to that. So okay. we'll get to the essence of behavior-driven development. Yeah, this is what this is all about. This is just what caused me to do that. So, so with these two items in mind, I wanted to push as much work down from the general to the general corporate users as possible. I wanted to free the developers up as much as possible to write code and deliver value. So that was the impetus uh, where I was that said, all right, let's give this a shot. So again, my reality, the users had the following complaints at this time. Number one, it takes so long to get the request completed. They put in a request and it seems like months for them to get this request to fruition and see its value. And also, when I get it, it's not what I wanted. <laughs> so we all know these realities. And this was with agile development, but still there are delays and there are still some misunderstandings of requirements. So with the developers, developers complaints, we don't like writing tests. And at this time, we were developing our software using test-driven development. The, the developers understood the benefits of using TDD, but they still didn't like writing the test. So their test, one of their complaints was, we don't like writing tests. They understand the benefit of it, but they didn't like doing it. And also, we don't know what the user wants to be done with all the edge cases. So they would get the user stories, but there are edge cases and boundary cases in that. And it wasn't clear at that point what was, what was wanted. I mean, we did our um, story refinement, our story decompositions, but still there were some unknowns. And the testers' complaints, we don't have time to automate the test. We're spending too much time 
running manual tests, so we don't have time to automate the test. So with these realities in mind, I realized, okay, so BDD was first of all, a sales marketing job. As Marcella shared a couple of weeks ago, people don't like to be changed. So I had to make them want to use BDD to understand the benefits for them to use BDD. They had to understand what was in it for them. And it truly was a win-win situation. But that's why I say, it was first of all, a sales and marketing job, because this involved change. And we know people don't like to be changed. So I had to sell it to them that they wanted this change, that there was something in it for them. So this was the negotiation with the users. I said, you provide the system behavior, the system expectations, and you will see it come, com you will see it completed sooner and it will behave as you expect, okay? A side benefit was that the users were engaged, excited, and more clearly owned the stories and that part of the system. They had a sense of pride when they used their system. It was their system. They had ownership, they had engagement. There was a little trepidation at first. It took a couple of go arounds to get them comfortable and up to speed and engaged in system thinking. They had to start thinking about how they want this system to behave under these circumstances. So that was the negotiation with the users. If you provide the behavior for the user story, then you will see it done, you will see it, your, your results completing sooner and it will behave as you expect. Negotiation with developers. If you focus on delivering the BDD supported user stories, then you will find the stories are clearer. And most of all, if, if not most, if not all of your test cases will be written and automated. So you won't have to write your test cases beforehand with TDD. You will just be coding to the tests that are automatically loaded into your code. And again, at the time, we were already using TDD, test-driven development, and this is just the next logical step in the development evolution. By putting a priority on BDD supported stories, it will reward the users that provided the scenarios by getting them their changes to that. And finally, with the testers, work with the users and help them think through possible scenarios and you will get your tests automated. Questions? So when you say users, your test is not really going to be really working with the with the with the users the way you kind of like explained that. Isn't it going to be your product owner who well, will yeah, yeah, yes, in this, yes, in this case, this one specific case, to get it started, I happen to have some internal users in accounting that were asking for changes. And I said this is the perfect opportunity. Uh, and and I knew what they wanted because I was uh, also quality assurance, quality control. And so they would come to me with questions about the system because I would do the testing and I was readily available. And I was sort of circumventing the PL, which is not good, the product owner. But again, this was an opportunity and I wanted to use this opportunity to push it. So once the teams saw what was in it for them and they saw it working, then I could get the, the all, all three parts of the triad in there, developers, the users, owners, product owners, and the testers. So again, this was just this per specific example, but then we expanded it to have the product owners, and we'll get into this later, but yes, in this case, these were situations where I, we were working on enhancing a, an existing system with user stories. And so I said, okay, users, let's work together and use behavior-driven development. So it acts exact, you get exact behavior that you define. Fair enough. Okay, then we'll Thank be going you. more. Yes. I've got a lot of talking to do, so strap yourself in. Okay, so behavior-driven development steps. Okay, and this is what we did. Start with the user story. First, take a small upcoming change to the system, a user story, and talk about concrete examples 
of the new functionality to explore. Ah, getting ahead. Okay, so discover and agree on the details of what's expected to be done. So this is this discovery phase, and we'll go into this more. So during discovery phase, we create the scenario. How how do we expect the system to behave when certain events or certain actions happen? Next is the formulate stage. Document the scenarios in a given when then format that allows it to be automated. Okay. And this also allows where we can check for agreement and understanding. Then automate the uh, automate the and implement the automated tests. So they import automatically import the given scenarios, the given when then scenarios into the code. And so now they have the test, which is the first step in test driven development. And finally, they just implement behavior described by each documented example, starting with the automated test to guide the development of the code. So then they provide the code to pass the test. The idea is to make each change small and iterate rapidly, moving back up a level each time you need more information. Each time you automate and implement a new example, you've added something valuable to your system and you're ready to respond to feedback. So we'll go into these steps in more detail. So when we're creating scenarios, who's involved? Again, this. In my example, it was the user, but generally it is the product owner is involved. One of these are, this is one of the triads. This, this person is most okay. concerned with the scope of the request. This involves translating the user stories into a series of scenarios. The product owner is responsible for deciding what is within scope. Customer centric stakeholders understand customer and business needs and the relative desirability and viability of the new requirement. So this is one of the people involved. Oh. Second person involved is the tester. This person will be generating a lot of scenarios and a lot of edge cases. They will look at how will the application break? What scenarios have we not accounted for within this user story and the acceptance criteria and things like that? Test centric stakeholders consider the exceptions, the edge cases and boundary conditions for the new behavior. And finally, the developer, this person will add many of the steps to the scenario and think of the details that go into each requirement. How will this application execute? What are some of the roadblocks or requirements behind the scenario? Development centric stakeholders understand the solution space and the technological feasibility. The conversations that are generated between these three uh, roles can produce great tests because each member of the triad sees the product from a different perspective. For this reason, it is essential that all of these roles have conversations to discover examples together. And to me, this is just the manifestation of a lot of the agile principles and values. I mean, you're seeing collaboration, you're seeing iteration. So that's why I was really sold on it. And it's amazing when you see it working. So the, the implementation, how I went about it, the first couple go around. On the first user story, I worked with the users, not the product owner, to create as many scenarios as we could think of. I wanted to introduce them to thinking about how they wanted the system to behave with exception, boundary conditions, or edge, edge cases are encountered. We then included these scenarios as part of the user story. When the developer got the user story, they reviewed these scenarios for understanding 
and then imported them into their code as tests. So think about it. When we first did this, I pushed it down onto the users. The product owners loved this. That helped them with their acceptance criteria. The developers loved it because they got automated testing. Okay. So on the next user story, I had the users provide as many scenarios as they could without me prompting them or guiding them. Okay. They did this on their own to let them get practice in the scenario creation mindset. So I had let them go a first time. So they start getting this mindset. Remember that has, that's a lot of agility mindset. Okay. They did a pretty good job. I didn't have to add too many other scenarios to what they provided. And so they were getting excited too. They were saying, hey, we're really now in control of our system. On the, users, on the third user story, the users provided the initial set of scenarios that were attached to the user story card. Then the three groups, the triad, collaborated on refining these scenarios. Okay, so let's go through the three different phases. The first one being discovery and you're discovering what it could do. We use structured conversation, conversations called discovery workshops that focus on real world examples of the system from the user's perspective. These conversations grow our team's shared understanding of the needs of our users, of the rules that govern how the system should function, and the scope of what needs to be done. So we're, we're covering the important parts of the user's understanding. This is part of the discovery. It may also re reveal gaps in our understanding where we need more information before we know what to do. The scrutiny of a discovery session often reveals low priority functionality that can be deferred from the scope of a user story helping the team to work in smaller increments, improving their flow. Beautiful, right? So that was discovered. Oops, no, sorry, wrong button. Bear with me. So now we are on to formulation, what it should do. As soon as we have identified at least one valuable example from our discovery sessions, we can now formulate each example as structured documentation. This gives us a quick way to confirm that we really do have a shared understanding of what to build. In contrast to traditional documentation, we use a medium that can be read by both humans and computers so that we can get feedback from the whole team about our shared vision of what we're building, and we'll be able to automate these examples to guide our development of the implementation. By writing these executable specifications collaboratively, we establish a shared language for talking about the system. This helps us to use problem domain terminology all the way down into the code. Beautiful, right? So once we're through with formulation, we get to automation, which is what it actually does. Now that we have our executable specification, we can use it to guide our development of the implementation. Taking one example at a time, we automate it by connecting it to the system as a test. The test fails because we have not implemented the behavior it describes yet through code. Now we develop the implementation code using lower level examples of the behavior of internal system components to guide us as required. The automated examples work like guide rail or guard rail, helping us to keep our development work on track, focused on just having the test pass and focusing just on providing the behavior that the users have requested. When we need to come back and pay, maintain the system later, 
the um, automated examples will help us to understand what the system is currently doing and to make changes safely without unintentionally breaking anything. This rapid, repeatable feedback reduces the burden of manual regression testing, freeing up people to do more interesting work like exploratory testing. And that's said by me, a true quality key. I love to do exploratory testing. So again, and we see uh, on our team, we didn't really document the code because the tests documented the code. And this just takes it to the next level. And it documents the code in user terminology, in domain terminology. So it, it's just, there's so many wins here. That is, I was, that's why I was excited to implement it. And when we started, after the first one, the developers really bought into it. The users bought into it for all the reasons given. Okay, so common myths and misunderstandings of behavior-driven development. Conversation. The myth is having conversations is more important than capturing conversations is more important than automating conversations. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's when you've automated these conversations through behavior-driven development, given, when, then format, it is a beautiful thing. It's not saying we don't have conversations. It's not saying we don't capture the conversation, but we capture those conversations. We have the conversations and we capture them through automated tech. Myth two, automation. The myth is you can automate scenarios after the code is implemented. You can, but that's not behavior driven development. Okay. Discovery. Discovery doesn't need a conversation. An individual can do it. That's not behavior-driven development. Discovery work needs to be done collaboratively. We want to bring together the representatives of the different specialists, all who need to share understanding about what is being built through behavior-driven development. Okay. So now we have science of BDD science of use of behavior-driven development. Documentation, a team using behavior-driven development should be able to provide a significant portion of functional documentation in the form of user stories augmented with executable scenarios or examples. And the common frame format is given when then. <laughs> Of the science of BDD is scenarios. Instead of referring to tests, a behavior-driven development practitioner will prefer the team term scenarios and specification. As currently practiced, behavior-driven development aims to gather in a single place the specification of an outcome valuable to a user, generally using role feature matrix of user stories, as well as examples or scenarios. It's expressed in the given, when, then format. These two notations being often considered the most readable. A single answer for unit tests, so a sign of BDD, a single answer for unit tests and functional tests. And emphasizing the term specification, the intent of behavior-driven development is to provide a single answer to what many Agile teams view as separate activities. The creation of user tests, I'm sorry, the creation of unit tests and technical code on the one hand, and creation of functional tests and features on the other hand. This should lead to increased collaboration between, guess what? Developers, test specialists, and domain experts. Another sign of use of BDD is behavior centric. Teams speak of the specifications of the behavior of the class. Rather than refer to the unit tests of a class, a practitioner or team using behavior driven development prefers to speak of the specifications of the behavior of the class. This reflects a greater focus on the documentary role of such specifications. 
Their names are expected to be more expressive and when completed with their descriptions in given when then format to serve as technical documentation. The specifications of the product behavior, rather than refer to functional tests, the preferred term will be specifications of product behaviors. The technical aspects of behavior-driven development are placed on an equal footing with technical techniques encouraging more effective conversations with customers, users, and domain experts. Okay, so let's go over a, a one example with a couple of scenarios. So the example, the title of the user story is customer withdraws cash. As a customer, I want to withdraw cash from an ATM so that I don't have to wait in line at the bank. So this is a, a just a general user story. And so let's see some of the examples of scenarios. So scenario one, the account is in credit. Given the account is in credit and the card is valid and the dispenser contains cash, when the customer requests cash, then ensure the account is deb debited and ensure that the cash is dispensed and ensure that the card is returned. So notice the use of and to connect multiple givens or multiple outcomes in a natural natural way. So it's pretty clear what this what the expectations of this and once you start going down this path, you'll other scenarios will just come up and we'll see a few more scenarios. They'll just come naturally, come naturally. Scenario two, the account is overdrawn past the overdraft limit. Given the account is overdrawn and the card is valid, when the customer requests cash, then ensure a rejection message is displayed and ensure the card is returned, but ensure that the cash is not dispensed. Notice that both of these scenarios are based on the same event and even have some givens and outcomes in common. In behavior-driven development scenarios, we wanna capitalize on this by reusing givens, events, and outcomes. And finally, a third scenario, attempt to withdraw more money than in the account. Given the account is in credit, and the card is valid, when the customer requests more cash than in the account, then ensure a rejection message is displayed and ensure that the cash is not spent and ensure the card is returned, but the balance is not changed. So the but highlights negative tests. Also note how this can lead to three other, at least three other scenarios. And one is where, so the previous examples, I, you always assume that this, there's cash in the dispenser. Well, what, how do we want the system to behave if there is no cash in the dispenser? And one where it doesn't contain enough. So, and, and think who should be involved. When we talk about domain experts, if there's not enough cash in the dispenser, Corporate security should be involved because so you want to put it. Do you want to put a message out to the person that there? Oh, we're out of cash, which lets them know, hey, cash is going to be coming soon. I may want to wait and uh, relieve them, the people that are bringing the cash, of their cash. So uh, this brings up these. What does the rejection message want to say? It, should there be a rejection message? All of these things are brought up through the scenario. Uh, do we want to say, okay? If it's if there's a, a certain level of cash in the in the ATM, we don't process anymore, and we just don't allow a card to be put in. But that might fr frustrate the customer. They don't know why it's not working. So all of these scenarios should build understanding of what 
different domain experts expect of the system to behave. We have uh, information security involved. And not since we're dealing with money, we have corporate security because there are security risks when you're dealing with money. Uh, we have accounting, you know, making sure that the balance is not changed. Or if they try an over, overdraw, maybe we say, okay, we're gonna have a charge for this. Any questions? All right. Uh, there yeah. are a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I, asking if whether or not, I think Joe, you had a question? Yeah, no, I was just curious. Those three different scenarios, do they turn out to be like three different stories under an epic or no, those, one, one that, story that's just. Those, those are three behaviors of the same story in this okay. case. And, and each team can do it. You could break, the, I mean, you may come up with scenarios where the team says, oh, no, no, this, we're, we're going to decompose this one user story and it will decompose into three or four other scenarios, I'm, I'm sorry, user stories. So this is a good way to decompose user stories because we want small user stories. We want right. independent user stories. So this is right. just another uh, method of doing it. I also think uh, Hiba had a question. Okay. Um, I can read it if they don't want to speak up. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, asking if does the does team do these scenarios with the PO during refinement? It seems similar to tasking work during planning. Um, my experience was we we did well first of all um once the the product owner got comfortable with writing the scenarios they would they would not only provide acceptance criteria for the story but they would provide the scenarios the behavior driven scenarios because it would allow the team to focus on coding so they would get their value sooner so but you definitely want to have all three uh, aspects, all three roles, the uh, user, the tester, and the domain specialist working together, collaborating. So that sounds like something that should happen during backlog refinement or user story refinement or user story decomposition. So uh, teams can do it differently, but generally this is something you would do in product backlog refinement. And that was our experience. Hey, Bob, if you had a new team, is this something you would suggest doing for a new team or would you want them to get a little bit more mature before you did something like this? I would, I would recommend, I would recommend that they, if they're not doing test driven development, I would say they start with test driven development Okay. because yeah, um, but it depends on the team. Uh, if the, if the team is open to it, then you could try it. You have to know your team. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, you're asking a lot. It depends on if your team already collaborates well with the product owner and the testers, then go for it. Yeah. If not, if there's, you know, you see these walls or, you know, some, some they don't collaborate as well. This, this may be the answer though. This may cause them to collaborate because it is a win, win, win situation. So, and again, it helps the testers because it helps them automate their unit tests and then they can pull these automations into the integration tests, regression tests. So, um, but it, it is definitely a different mindset. If, if you are getting stakeholders or corporate users, you know, you might get them more involved. It is a mindset change. Hopefully your product owner does not have to undergo too much of a mindset cultural change to be doing this, but yeah. it is, the, is a mindset. So they start thinking of edge cases, of boundary cases, of exceptions. So again, it's a change of that. And that's where you might want to have uh, your test specialist work with the product owner before engaging the developers to get as much done. As I said, our reality was the developers were the king of the hill. You know, and so uh, we wanted them to focus on writing code. 
if they were coders, we wanted them to focus writing on code. If we could help them with their tests anyway, we did it. Yep. So I don't really have a question, but I just want to do like a brain check to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. Um, so from, from what you're saying and from what I understood is, you know, you do some a collaborative uh, session for discovery to learn the behavior of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and that involves your product owner, um, the testers and the development team to, to right. go through that exercise. And then right. you're trying to build automate, automated testing based on those behaviors. And then once you do that, uh, then you wanna develop towards kind of like that's, that to me is kind of where the test driven development comes in and develop towards passing that code um, yeah. based on the behavior of the scenarios that you came up in your discovery session. Right, so if you format your scenarios in the given when then format, which is the Gherkin format, right. it can be automatically imported into the code using Cucumber as one tool. There are other tools that you can use, but that's why the developers love it is it, it automatically loads the code uh, into the code to test. So all they have to do is write the code to pass the test. And they're involved in the, the, both the, the format, the formulate and the automate. <clears throat> One last thing real quick, if you don't sure. mind, you mentioned sure. TDD um, yeah. to start with TDD before going to BDD for the people that were not on our previous call. Can you give us a one line description of the TDD? Yes, T TDD is test driven development. There's also acceptance test driven development. So um, acceptance test driven development is just taking the acceptance test that the product owner um, provides in the user story to create the test. So the first thing they use, the, the coder does is write the test uh, that will prove that the code meets the acceptance criteria. And then they run those tests and run the code. So the, the tests are the unit tests. This is unit tests. The unit tests are coded in the code and then the code is run and all the tests fail because there's no code to pass the test and then the developers focus on passing each test individually and writing just enough code to pass the test and once they so if you if they have written uh 10 tests to start their coding because these are the 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 acceptance criteria or these are the scenarios that will prove that the user story does what it's supposed to do they will write enough code to pass the first test and then show it passed and nine failures. And then they write more to pass second test and the first test. Two pa passes, eight failures. And they just keep iterating through that, writing just enough. And I remember, oh, when we first started, one of the questions we were, I think, Rick, we were doing one of the um, uh, uh, CIO uh, exposures to Agile. And one of the questions was, how do you prevent gold plating, you know, or providing uh, features that are asked for or scope creep. And I said, test-driven development. If the product owner says, yes, these are the acceptance criteria and the, the developers write the test first and just code for enough to pass those, they don't have, they don't have any chance. They don't have the opportunity to gold plate or uh, write unnecessary code. And so it keeps the um, code very tight. And also think about this. You have all your tests with test-driven development and you've coded to it. When you go in to, re, to, uh, to refactor your code, refactoring is not changing behavior or functionality. It's just repurpose or, you know, making it better, more efficient. And so you have the same test. You refactor your code, you run the test they pass, you haven't destroyed behavior. So that's another um, one of the benefits of test-driven development. And as I said before, with test-driven development, we used our tests as documenting what the code does. What is the behavior of the code? People ask, what's the behavior of code? Ah, look at, look at the code. The tests tell you. 
And the beauty of that is those don't get stale. They don't go stale. That's exactly what it does. When you have external documentation, the, that document tends to get stale. No one wants to keep it up to date. Uh, the code changes, specification change, and we keep it in a separate place. So we forget to update the, doc, the system documentation. And the beauty of behavior-driven development is you're using domain terminology. So the, the cases, the scenarios are written in domain specific terminology and that is imported into code. So now the developers understand the domain better. They understand the nomenclatures used in the domain. So I, I hope I didn't, I, I probably over answered the question, I hope. <laughs> Well, it, it definitely told me that BDD is a win-win for the developers and for the yeah. users, uh, the business and the product owners and testers. So yeah. yes, I guess I that's believe. a win-win-win-win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you intend to go to BDD, why start with TDD? Uh, because BDD is speaking the language that everyone understands and it's a simple English that anyone can relate to. By starting with TDD, and as, as we all know, Devs don't like to write, they don't like writing text. So it's to uh, actually may possibly start with BDD and start how you intend to finish, if that makes uh, sense. Yeah, the only reason I could give you that is begging the question is TDD is more readily accepted by the developers, that's been proven by developers. BDD may not, but there is no reason. If your team is mature enough and your um, collaboration and conversations are mature enough. Yeah, go to B, go for BDD. And guess what? You can try BDD one you, one user story and see how it works. That's what I did. I tried a simple user story and I said, let's use BDD. And again, it's your it's your marketing, your sale. If you sell this, yeah, you don't need to go to TDD. Just remember, people don't like to be changed. Involve them, engage them. Let them know this is a win-win-win situation. And it sells itself, I'm telling you. Hey, Bob. There, there was question. a few. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Um, go ahead. Um, does it matter any kind of story, the application or developmental kind of story? Does it matter any kind of story that could be used to do that testing? I couldn't, I did not encounter one. I did not, I never, but we, I mean, I, I, we used it toward the end of my time at this uh, company, but I did not encounter a user story that we could not use behavior driven development in it. The only user story you may not be able to use behavior driven development in is one that has a product owner that does not want to go through the effort of providing the scenarios, you know, but that's, that, then you need to get in, to me, you need to get a new product owner because that is not an engaged product owner because it just, I love the scenarios because it helps you think boundary cases. It yeah. helps you think edge cases. So yeah, I, I did not, I never encountered a user story I couldn't. And I would like to know one because it may be that the user story you're using needs to be de decomposed a little more, but these scenarios may help you identify that it needs to be decomposed and how to decompose it. Cool. Thank you, Robert. So you're welcome. You're saying that testers are cheaper than developers. So what kind uh, of testing are we talking about? We're talking about manual testing? Well, that was, yes, manual testing. That was my experience. Because, and you're talking uh, about where someone else has written the test script and the tester is just executing it. No, I, well, right. I'm saying even even a tester writes the test scripts, but that was my general experience, and that was I was the tester at that time. Okay, and I, you're talking about care. and you're talking about when you're talking about automation, are you talking about something where you're just doing something that'll have to be re-recorded if anything changes and you're not checking an existing system and existing test cases that already need to continue to work? Uh, well, okay, so what this, what this is, this is importing a unit test into the code. But what it helps is your tester or testers to think of tests 
for your performance testing, for your stress testing, for your integration testing, uh, and for um, behaviors of the uh, UI testing. So it just, it just helps the, the testers expand their understanding of the behavior of the system so they write better tests. But they don't have to write unit tests. Uh, that is automated with this. Uh, but it may help them when they go to their integration test and their performance tests. Okay. The reason I was asking is just there are different categories of testing that, and the people yeah. that execute it are not all the same events right. and, and they're not all equally easy to find. So what you're talking yeah. about is true, but there are lots of other scenarios where you need people that have special skill sets and cost as much as the developers. And usually they are developers who just like to test. Right. And, th and this, what I was saying is this was my experience at that time. That drove me with that mindset. That drove me to say, I want to push as much as I can away from the developers because they were harder for us to find at that time and push it to the testers or push it to the user community. So that was just that what was specifically prompted me to look for ways to push work off of the developers and let them focus just on coding. So even if it doesn't apply, even if they all apply, to me, even if your testers get paid more, great, because you're automating tests, so they have less to do. And again, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I understand what you're saying now, because you're talking about, it's not even just what they cost, it's how scarce are the resources, how hard are they to find. And yeah. what's the quality you're going to be able to obtain in the time frame you need? Yep. Other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, uh, sorry, I've joined a little late. I'm sorry for, for that. No worries. Yeah. So my question is twofold. Um, how early can the... All right. The answer is yes and no. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. So... So the first part of the question is, how early there, uh, we can engage the testing folks? Because let's say we are starting from sprint one and uh, the development team still are uh, busy and engaged in understanding the requirement, understanding the dependencies, understanding the, uh, um, the basic uh, requirements. Um, so uh, my question is like sometimes at what stage can we engage the testers? Uh, uh, how early can we engage them parallelly while uh, um, the uh, while the development team is still um, you know designing the system and things like that? How soon we can engage and how can we engage? Because sometimes we see that you know some some part of the team is less engaged and some some members of the team are more engaged. Uh, how can we do that with this approach? How can we engage all the people uh, equally um, in the team uh, with this approach? That's first part of my question. The second part is is kind of a relatively easy one. I'm just wondering, is there any common tool where we can both the uh, development team and the tester uh, testing team can um, you know, play, uh, try their hands on and, uh, you know, um, probably uh, write their test cases and uh, around the same um, um, tool which has the, their code base so that, you know, cross-functioning happens between the developers and the testers. Thank you. Okay, so in the first part, uh, the first question is, you, you can engage the testers as soon as you want. Uh, I find because, again, not test, test specialists, quality specialists, let's call them quality specialists, quality control specialists with their focus on testing, okay? I would engage them uh, as early, I would have the product owner or the user engage them when they first formulate the user story to get their unique pr perspective and uh, system knowledge of how the system, uh, the edge cases of the system, the boundary cases, uh, and because that's the, my my experience is testers, and I'm a tester has that mindset. The first thing I think about when I see this is I think of how can I break it? You break it through edge cases, you break it through errors, you break it through boundary. That's their mindset. So now they work with the product owner, and they start the product owner starts getting that mindset. So just 
but you want to have all three roles engaged during product backlog refinement at some point. So you might say, okay, early on, we can just have the product owner and the, and the quality specialist work together to come up with as many scenarios as they can. And, and later on, it might just be, well, the PO, the product owner feels comfortable enough with this. They'll, cre they'll provide the scenarios. And then they say, okay, I've provided the scenarios for this user story. And remember, it's a user story. So it's not like this whole new system we're writing, but it is a user story. And when we get to product backlog refinement and they present this user story, they are saying, okay, I'm presenting this user story. These are the acceptance criteria. And by the way, here are the scenarios I thought of. Now let's see what we all can collaborate to come up with more scenarios to fully understand how we expect this system to behave. And remember, there's a lot of we, us, let us do this. So it's a lot of collaboration and ownership. Oh, and so, and so now the second, did that answer the first question? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay. And the second question is, you can use just about any text editor tool as long as it is in a given when then format. With that format, you can use Cucumber as the tool to import that into your code. And uh, we were using Groovy, so I don't know if it's limited to that, but I know we could use uh, Cucumber to import it into that. And there is I forget what it's fit. I don't forget what that stands for is another tool that you can import Gherkin scripts, which is the given when then script format into uh, your code. So there are tools and you just need it. It's like, you just need a text editor. Anything you would write your documentation on, you can do this. So we were using uh, Jira to create our user story. It's just text. You could, the, the developers can copy and paste that text into the document that they're going to import. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Do we want to try, uh, do we want to go to the Jamboard and try creating some scenarios? I have a Jamboard set up where, uh, where I, ha I have the three scenarios examples I gave and y'all can go to town and uh, try your hand at writing BDD scenarios. I have a question, Bob. Sure. Do you do anything with spikes in BDD? Uh, I would say there would be an opportunity to do that with spikes because spikes are discovery. If you are writing code in your spike, then this is an opportunity to use the same format to import your test. Okay. But generally, it would be just the um, developers working on spikes. So they might just want to just do their test-driven development and write the, the, the unit test manually. Oh. I, ne I never ran into that, but it just thinking through that makes sense. Thank you. And um, if anybody is not listening, please, the chat, there's some nuggets there. Copy it and take it home. The bearded one did a lot of work there. Yeah, I'm copying it. <laughs> You're saving the chat. <laughs> I'm saving it. <laughs> the bearded one's not talking, but he's typing. He's, he's typing. He's <laughs> typing away. <laughs> Great stuff. He's supporting all, everything you say, Bob. <laughs> All right, jam board time. Oh, it's your muted. Yeah. Did you uh, share the link to the gym and go yes, to? Yes, sir. On the tab line. The, all right, two, three, four, five. So, share with them, please. So, oh, people are already there. So the one I see is not in a given when then. It's missing the given. So be careful of that that cannot be imported because it's missing the given. So just be aware of that. So I'm glad we're doing these scenarios so you get an exercise to do it.
Oh, and also I forgot to say, what this may do and what it should draw is instead of just the message is displayed, it should say this is the new message that is expected. And that's another thing. It, it you, because that, that would be the first question I would have is, no, what does the message say? So then the user supplies what the message should say. And that gets put in the test and that gets put in the code. We'll give another five minutes or so and then review some of those. That looks like a story, but not a scenario for this user story. So if we want to talk through some scenarios, to me, one scenario would be um, I, I have an invalid card, or I have a card that is then flagged as fraud. So that would be a scenario that would be addressed by this user story, because I want to withdraw cash from an ATM, but I don't have a valid card. My card has been flagged as fraud. So that would be another. Uh, given uh, the account is in credit and the card is invalid, then, when, given when then, when the customer tries to use the card, then what is the then? Is the card retained and not given back to the customer? So that, again, what do they want? The developer doesn't know. This is what, how the user has to start thinking how they want the system to behave. If someone uses an invalid card, do we give it back? Do we not give it back? Do we give a message? And what message is? So. Plenty of board space for scenarios. And if you want to just talk through some, feel free. The floor is open. Hey, Bob, uh, what can you, can you talk a little bit more about the developer aspect of the testing and utilizing these tools? I was reading recently about developers and their ability to build the test scenarios in the code itself to help mitigate any potential problems as they're doing the build. Right. What, is, what is your experience on that? Well, my, my experience is, is we did TDD so that the developers who are writing unit tests and a lot of, well, at first, uh, they would not be aware of the uh, negative scenarios, the negative errors or any error situations. It took training and it took, you know, uh, a mindset change for them to get used to writing true, full, um, uh, comprehensive unit test. So everything is, and that's where the quality control specialist came in and worked with them. Uh, but that, that, that's all it is, is they're just writing code and hopefully the acceptance, if you're not providing behavior driven development, hopefully the acceptance criteria will lead to enough of the uh, sample of what unit tests should be written that they have complete coverage. And Generally, uh, they will find if they have complete coverage once they write their unit test and they build the code and they give it to their quality control specialist, if they find 
failures or behavior that's not expected, then they will point that out. And then the developer learns, oh, why did I miss this unit test? What was my thought process? And how can we have, prevent that from happening again? Quality improvement, you know, our retrospective. So uh, maybe your quality control specialist needs to provide uh, quality mindset workshops with your developers, or maybe they need to be pairing. When, when the developer first starts writing a user story, maybe your developer, instead of pairing with another developer, pairs with your quality control uh, specialist to write the test first and help them write the test. That way, your quality control specialist starts getting a coding mindset and your developer starts getting a quality mindset, another win-win scenario. And it gets people out of this mindset of only developers pair. So of course we know product owners should be pro pairing with um, developers, developers pairing with security information, security specialists, uh, the database specialists. So again, it's pair work, not pair programming. Try and move past paired programming into pair work. And so you're pairing with your quality control specialists, your information specialists, and that way every member on your team starts getting this mindset. So what I said, our team was not a DevOps team. It was a QualSec DevOps team. Everybody had a quality mindset. Everybody had a security mindset. Everybody had a development mindset and everybody had an operations mindset. Now we had specialists in those areas, but we tried to promote everybody having that mindset. And I probably talked too much, Bill. Do we want to view, view any of the scenarios that were there or do we want to call it a night and get early release? Or ask more questions. Good, good, yeah, expounded upon the message, yeah. Yeah, so a lot, I like that scenario. Um, it's more detail. And you see the use of and, and, and. That's just more more information about behavior. Great. Which, which one are you looking at, Bob? I'm looking at the one that goes beyond the uh, sticky and alert the bank to customer, so customer support, customer has invalid uh, cards. I can't see the whole thing on the board that's being shared. Let me uh, move it for there, you. There Thank you go. Thank you. Yeah, so this is great. This is this is um, customer support. You know, you're you're working with the customer. You're showing that the customer is valuable. Uh, some companies don't put value on keeping customers. They put too much value and too much money into getting new customers where they should focus on keeping their customers. And doing something something simple like this will keep a customer. So yeah, good scenario. I love it. <laughs> Kevin, I'm hungry. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and, and Bob talks too much. <laughs> so great job. Great presentation, Bob. Love it. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me uh, ramble on. Good stuff, Bob. Thank you. Yes, great job, Bob. Thank you. Great job, Bob. Thank you very much. And I'll think of what's next. I had one on the back burner, but I forgot to let me see if I can put it back on the front burner and provide another presentation in two months. I'll give you a two month break and see if we want to talk about it. All right. Bye. Yay, Bob. All right. Marcelo's giving you the thumbs up. He's still not talking. He is the man. He is the man. He's the reason I went down the agile path. So I have him to thank and him to thank. Now nah, he's blushing, Bob. He's about to cry. <laughs> you can see that through the beard, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's about to cry. <laughs> Hey, Bob, I have a very silly question for you. 
this yeah, I have a silly answer. This is development in general. It doesn't have to really be particular to agile versus waterfall, right? It's just development in general or not. Marcel is shaking his head no. It's no, not. it's not. Okay, it's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how I read the head shake. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But generally, well, I can't say it. I, I've been out of waterfall so long, I don't know what they do anymore. And I don't want to go back. The, the last project I worked on in waterfall, it was a 58 page requirements documentation. It took me forever to get through it. And I, I would go to sleep and my eyes were crossed and you'd be reading and what, what was on page 37 contradicted what was on page 12. So you'd have to remember that it was brutal. So I don't want to go back. 